So this happened a while back, while I was probably around 11 or 10 years old, meaning my brother, who we'll call Alex, was around 8 or 9. We were walking home from the bus, which takes about 7 minutes to do, when I noticed that something was off. I didn't see anything at first, but I could just feel that something was wrong. So, my brother and I start walking home, as the only two who got off at our stop were him and I. This blue and silver beat-up truck drives right past us, and I think nothing of it. It never slowed down or stopped, it just kept going. Alex and I were holding hands, as my grandmother always told me to do with him. He's my baby brother, and I want nothing to happen to him, of course. Nothing happened at first. But then I saw the same truck drive around again, driving our way this time. There was a cul-de-sac at the end of the road. It was driving much slower this time, and went up the road and turned out of sight. Now Alex and I were nearing the three-way intersection that connected the cul-de-sac road to the other side road, right off the main road the man had just drove down. I happened to look down the street and see the truck driving real slow down the street towards us once again. I knew we had to run. I knew there was no other option. I knew that if we didn't, my brother and I wouldn't be safe. I don't know how I knew, but I just had a feeling. As soon as we passed a house that blocked us from view, I turned to Alex and spoke to him exactly four words. No questions. Just run. And we did. In our driveway, which is about a hundred feet long, by the way. There were a row of bushes and pine trees that divide our home from our next-door neighbor. I dragged him into the bushes and told him to be quiet and then I'd explain it all to him later. I watched quietly as the same truck drove down and around the cul-de-sac once again before coming to a stop right in front of our house. I had to hold my brother's mouth closed because he was crying and I was scared that whoever was following us would hear him and come hurt us. I was more worried for him than for myself at this point. I was in fight or flight mode. I was the big sister, and I had to protect him. I looked at him and said that the truck was following us. I told him not to be scared. I said I wouldn't let anyone hurt him, and it seemed to calm him down just a little. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, the door to the truck opened, and out stepped a man. He was tall, skinny, and messy. Short hair covered by a torn baseball cap, ripped jean shorts, and a puke green tank top. He entered our yard and looked around a bit. Alex and I were still in the bushes, and I was trying to find a way to get to our house safely without getting the man's attention. The guy left after what felt like forever and entered his car. He started it and drove away slowly. I waited a few minutes to make sure he was completely gone before turning to my brother and saying, We need to run. When I count to three, we're going to run behind the house to the back door, okay? He agreed, and we waited a few more seconds before I started counting. I still didn't have a good feeling about this, but I knew we had to move. I started counting. As soon as I hit three, we booked it across our driveway and into our front yard to go around the house. As soon as we left our spot, I heard it. The sounds of accelerating. He'd seen us. He was waiting for us to leave. The man chased us up our driveway as we ran around the side. I grabbed Alex's hand and practically dragged him around the house and made him run ahead to the garage door to see if it was locked while I searched for my house key. The garage door was open. I swear to God, I saw this man around the opposite corner of the house that we did as soon as we entered. As we entered, I slammed it shut, locking and deadbolting it. I didn't stop running until I opened the house door and ran downstairs with Alex, screaming our safe word. My grandmother made a safe word for us that was a normal everyday word we could use if we were in danger. Just had to scream it out, basically. It woke my aunt who worked the night shift and was sleeping. We told her everything, and she stayed up with us until my grandmother got home. We called the police, and that was my first ever interaction with an officer. The man was never caught. And to this day, I still don't know what he wanted, but I'm fairly certain it wasn't good. I'm just glad my grandma drilled stranger danger into my head. I don't know where my brother or I would be right now if she hadn't.
I posted this in another subreddit as well. When I was in high school, it was my senior year. I was about 5 foot 3, about 95 pounds as well. I was at the park down the street from my house, waiting for the school bus to arrive. Usually my boyfriend, who had already graduated, would drive me to school, but he was busy. I later found out he was cheating. Well, there were usually a few of us girls there together waiting, but on this day, I was the only one. I sat at a bench and had one headphone in, one out so I could listen to my surroundings. I've always been cautious of what's going on around me. As I waited, a black Honda pulled up, and immediately I noticed it. I decided to keep an eye on it, because I just had a bad feeling. I wasn't making it obvious that I was watching it, because I didn't want to look crazy, but after about a few minutes, two big men got out. I immediately texted my boyfriend that I was at the park, and that these guys were creeping me out. Of course, he didn't text back, so I copied and pasted the same text to my cousin who was home. I lived with my aunt and two guy cousins, unwinding down from the night shift. I wanted someone to know the car make and color, plus it was two men. Didn't get any responses. When they got out of their car, they immediately started to walk towards me. I got up from the bench and walked towards the street, because the bus was supposed to be there any minute. The driver actually ended up being a little late. As I stood by the street, these men walked up to me, and I could feel the bad energy right away. One man said hello, as the other stood there staring me down. I just did a small smile and a nod, then I looked away. The same guy, I'll call him number one, suddenly asked how old I was. I didn't respond. I could tell the other guy, number two, was getting mad that I wasn't feeding into it. Number one kept asking me yes or no questions. Do you have a boyfriend? Do you live close? Do you do drugs? We have some. Do you want some? Number two asked me if I knew what the black market was. I felt a cold rush go over my body, and I got the chills. Number two, who was quiet the whole time, started to tell me they just got back from Russia, but the way he said it was so scary, almost intimidating. I knew they were from somewhere else because they had very strong accents, but I couldn't pinpoint the place. They kept telling me to go into their car because they had drugs. I said no thank you. Trust me, I wasn't a straight edge in high school, but I wasn't stupid either. I would never get into somebody's car that I didn't know. Then number one asked if I had a car. I said no, and that my bus was almost here so I had to go. By some sort of miracle, the bus rounded the corner, and the men backed off. They had been inching closer and closer as they asked me those questions, but before the bus got to me, Number one handed me a card and said he had a car shop and to call him sometime if I needed anything. He even stated he'd give me a free car. The card looked very shifty. I didn't want to grab it, but I knew that I'd need the number to report on it. I took it and they walked off super fast. Finally, the bus stopped and picked me up. As soon as I got on, I started to cry. I had a complete meltdown. It was like all of the adrenaline was keeping my mind and body aware and focused while the men were there, but as soon as I was safe, my body and mind gave out. Thankfully, there weren't many people on the bus, so the driver helped to calm me down a little before we took off, and I explained to her what had happened. She looked around for the car, but they were already gone. She said she'd seen them around me, but thought that I knew them because they were so close to my person. The driver called into her dispatch, saying there was an incident so that they could notify the school. She continued to pick all of the other students up, but when we got to school, she walked me right into the office. I was absolutely terrified to be alone. The principal came out, and so did campus security. They were very sweet and gentle with me, as they brought me back to the principal's office. Both were men, and they proceeded to ask me questions about the men, their car, and the questions they had asked me. I cried the whole time. I pulled out the card the man gave me and handed it to the principal. He looked at the security and said he was going to call it and act like my dad, so he did. It was on speaker, and number one answered. I knew his voice as if it was burned into my brain. It took everything in me not to have a panic attack. The principal asked the guy if he could get him a car at a good price, and the guy played dumb. 
The principal said his daughter, me, had given him the card. As soon as he said that, the man hung up. They tried calling again, but the phone was shut off, then eventually disconnected. I could see a shift in the principal and security as soon as the phone clicked. The security got on his phone and called the police and had them come right to the school. It was as if they finally knew it was real, like my crazy story wasn't all made up. The principal excused himself and the security guard, and they talked for a minute in the hall. I could hear everything they were saying, though. She's lucky to be alive. This is serious. We need to call her parents to come get her right now. When the police got there, they came into the office that I was sitting in and asked me the whole story again in front of the principal and security guard. I felt like they wanted to see if I was being 100% honest, so I obliged. The officers were straight up with me and told me that it sounded like they were watching us girls at that park because they chose the one day that only one of us was there. He also said the card was being used as bait to get me to go where they wanted. I felt sick. I couldn't breathe. The school called my aunt, but she didn't pick up. The only person that picked up first was my boyfriend. One of the officers talked to him as the other finally got a hold of my aunt. My boyfriend ended up picking me up and taking me home, and I cried the whole time. When I got there, my grandma, uncle, aunt, mom, and cousins were all out front. All the women were in tears, and the men were livid but worried for me. A week later, some girl at another local high school not far from the park was saved by other students. She was being dragged into a black Honda by two men. The other kids saw and stood up and grabbed her and pulled her out of their car. The principal called me into his office, and that's how I found out. They also had the same officers there and had me choose the two guys out of a picture lineup. I pointed them out fast, and they were caught right away. It was, in fact, those two guys that tried grabbing the girl. A freshman girl. I worried for her and was sad she went through worse than I did, and felt almost free again. Still scared, but not looking over my shoulder as often. I couldn't believe that they were caught so fast. After that, my family teamed up to drive me to school for the rest of the year. My boyfriend, now ex, also took me some days. I'm thankful to be alive and well, and I'm even more thankful that the girl was also saved by those courageous kids at her high school. I was in college. My roommate was a born-again Christian, and she invited me to her Bible study in church all the time. Eventually, I did go, and I kept going. I wasn't a big fan of the pastor, but there were a lot of nice young adults who liked to have clean, sober fun. I didn't drink or party, so I felt like I fit in there. But I didn't agree with everything they believed in, just the more normal stuff. God, helping the poor, not some of the other things. This one guy in Bible study, Drew, was pretty quiet, very good looking. He seemed like he knew everything about the Bible, which amazed me. I thought, I know nothing about all this. He's so wise. I was 21 and he was 27. He wasn't a college student, he just worked, which I later learned maybe he didn't even do that. We were going to go on a young adult retreat, and because I worked, I couldn't leave early on Friday to drive up to the mountains with the girls in the group. Mutual friends said that I could ride with Drew, so I said, okay. On the way up, Drew was pretty quiet for the first hour. Not friendly at all, and it was a long trip. As we got closer to the mountains, though, he really warmed up. We got a pizza and he paid, which was very nice of him. Then he stopped the car just so we could look at the stars. He even played some Brian McKnight. He was turning it into a date, but I didn't know it or see it that way back then. I was really starting to like him and feel like we had a connection. He's just about to drop me off at the girl's cabin when he suddenly gets very serious. He tells me that something happened between him and another girl in our church group, but she's telling lies about him and not to believe whatever I hear. He didn't explain what actually happened, and he didn't say who it was either. I enter the cabin and all the girls are there. Very quickly, one girl, Bree, who was probably the youngest in the group at only 19, tells all of us, Ladies, there's a wolf in sheep's clothing among us at this retreat. 
Now, if you don't know much about church folk, they get very dramatic and talk like this all the time. So I thought, okay, here's some drama. She tells us this story about how she was talking to some guy here, but he started stalking her, wouldn't take no for an answer, and even threatened her sister. Now my spotty sense was up. I realized this must be what Drew was telling me about. The church group doesn't know who it is because she won't say. She doesn't want to gossip and she says the leadership will handle it. Well, Drew eventually leaves the weekend retreat early. And there goes my ride back, I thought. I don't know if he was asked to leave or what. That week, Drew asked me to hang out, and we did. I still liked him, and I didn't know who to believe. On our hangout, we didn't really do anything. Took me to the mall, read the Bible to me. Okay, cool. Then he parks his car on some suburban lookout, top of the world type of thing. Says he's a view guy and really likes the views. I'm not one to be impressed by suburban lights, so I just thought it was pretty boring. I decided to give him another chance. I invited him to come see a play with me. When he came, he immediately meets one of my friends, Brian. Brian introduces us to his boyfriend, Nick. I'm in theater, so I have many gay friends. Well, for the majority of the rest of the date, Drew lectured me about how all gays are going to hell, and I must really not love them if I don't stop to tell them that. I eventually cry because it's this ugly argument in his car we're having for hours in the parking lot of Panera. I say I want to go home. It was basically the worst date ever. I don't agree with what he says. He also tells me I need to give up my dream of being an actress, because what if the Lord doesn't want me to do that? Theater is something I did my entire life, not to mention my major. His reasons for me giving it up had nothing to do with the impracticality of it, but because of God. This guy was nuts. I get home and I offer to make us some cocoa, to just kind of end things as friends, or at least on a better note. I know I'll see him at church again, and we have mutual friends. We're in the same Bible study, too. Things got weird. He tried to get sexual with me again, but also blamed me for tempting him. How, with my tear-stained, exhausted face? I ended up crying again. I just wanted him to go home, but I was so emotionally exhausted I didn't know what to make of this. He called and texted me all that week, and I didn't respond. Then it's a Sunday night. I'm talking to my friend Tim, who no longer goes to that church anymore. I tell him that I went on a date with Drew. Before I can even tell him how it went, Tim says, What? That guy is crazy. You need to abort that mission. Tim tells me that he's close with Bree and her family, and that Drew was a stalker, and he indeed threatened Bree's sister. I didn't know what to believe, because it sounded like Tim just believed it based on her story. I hung up and called my mom to try and tell her what happened, what Tim told me about Drew, how it was such weird timing considering what happened with me. While I was still on the phone with my mom, I got a knock at the door. It was 10pm on a Sunday night. I looked out the peephole, but nobody was out there. I go to get my roommate and ask her if she could just sit with me in the front room because I was freaked out and thinking someone was there. There was another knock at the door. I open it. It's Drew and he looks all in a frenzy. I ask him what he's doing there. He said he just needed to talk to me. I wasn't answering my phone, which was because I was genuinely busy earlier in the day. The conversation was getting long and my roommate is still sitting there so I tell her she can go back to her room, and it's okay. I let him come in because I was overly conditioned to be nice, and this was a big mistake. We started talking, but as soon as my roommate was gone, he pulled out a knife. He started saying how he was worried my neighbors did something to me because I wasn't answering his texts, and he didn't know what kind of situation he would be walking into. I have zero fighting skills, no experience in this type of situation at all. I calmly say as casually as possible, Hey, can you put that knife away? It makes me feel uncomfortable. He asked me if I wanted the knife. I say no, I just wanted to pretend it isn't here. I somehow talked him down and got him to leave. I think I convinced him he still had a shot with me somehow. The next morning, my mind was clearer. I felt like I needed to tell my mom what happened. She has me tell my dad, who has me tell the church youth leader and security at my apartment. I tell a cop the whole story, and he says this guy is definitely a stalker, and I will see him again unless the police call him. 
I tell him it's fine. I think everything will be okay. No need to call. I didn't want more drama. I had never talked to a policeman about anything before. I was still processing and didn't understand that this was a serious issue. My mistake. The next night I went to a party, another church-related one, but Drew was not supposed to be here. He told me before that he wasn't going. Well, he was there. I decided to leave, but my 21-year-old self doesn't think to ask to have someone walk me out. I figure if I left and he was still there, problem solved. I didn't anticipate him realizing I'd left and deciding to follow me. I'm walking to my car in a dark apartment parking lot when I hear him call out my name. He was following me. I started running and said I didn't want to talk. He started chasing me. I'm clicking my car to open, thinking this is how white girl dies because she didn't let the cop call the stalker. Thankfully, my car unlocked. I got in and drove away. The problem was he knew where I lived. I moved out two weeks later, and I blocked him on all social media and phone numbers. Drew eventually somehow managed to make another Facebook profile and sent me a message that summer. He said he was praying for me and had forgiven me for trashing him to people, even though I had never told anyone about what happened, except for the useless pastor who did nothing. That was the last I saw or heard of him. Unfortunately, this predator continues to serve at that church in the junior high ministry of all places, around many young girls. No one on church leadership listened to me or to Bree, who both complained that this guy was stalking us. I never reached out to Bree to let her know what happened to me, and I never got to hear her story in detail either, but I had told the young adult pastor about the knife and him trying to get sexual with me and how I was scared. Thankfully, I don't go to that church anymore. This was all pre the Me Too movement. What sucks is I've had more than a few experiences with crazy religious dudes. This was the first, but definitely not the last. I'm still trying to come to terms with why that is. This happened last night and the night before. A little backstory first. I live in a not so safe area. The block I'm on is okay, but if I walk down my street a block or two, you could get shot, offered drugs, be mugged, and so much more. When we leave the house, we head up a side street that sort of steers us away from trouble. Like I said, my actual block isn't that bad. We all get along here. Most people on this block are related to each other, all but for my household. But even though we're strangers to the neighbors, they're all nice to us. The people right next door have dogs as well as a few other households. Again, we are the odd ones out in that department as well. The dogs only bark when someone is out on our block that doesn't live here. I've always felt safer because of these dogs. I live in a home converted into a duplex. When you walk in the front door, you're in the entryway and then across the entryway you see my apartment door. And then if you go up the stairs beside my door, you'll find the door to the second apartment. The front door to the house has no lock mechanism at all. It's so tenants cannot lock each other out of the house. We can only lock the doors to our apartments. When you walk into the entryway, a motion sensing light comes on. No one is currently living in the upstairs apartment right now. So at this time, it's just me and my hubs, husband, living in the place. Two nights ago, hubs was in bed, and I was watching TV. I was all relaxed and thinking about going to bed soon. It was nearly 1am in the morning. Suddenly, I got this overwhelming, uncomfortable feeling. I felt hot and sick in my stomach. I had the intrusive thought that I needed to check the apartment door to make sure it was locked. I tried to brush the feeling off, but I just couldn't. So I got up to look. Just as I got there, I heard someone open the screen door on the outer house. I looked and the door was locked. Then I heard the actual door to the house open and someone step into the entryway. I was terrified. I know no one lives upstairs and my landlord said he would call to let me know if someone was moving in. We don't ever get visitors this late or without a phone call first. Also, with this pandemic and social distancing, no one should be coming over. Then I heard a click. I recognized the click as the sound the motion light makes when it turns on. I heard a male voice cry out, Oh shit! The sound of someone running out of the house echoed. I was terrified. 
I stood there trying to process what had just happened. From the time I heard the screen door open until a solid minute after the person ran out, I stood there frozen. The neighborhood dogs were barking their heads off all that night, and they only do that if someone is around that they don't know. I think that someone who doesn't know that the house is a duplex attempted to let themselves in. The light, which is way too bright for that tiny entryway, came on and scared the person away. I woke up Hubs and we called the police. They said that since the person wasn't trying to get into my apartment exactly, they weren't coming out. The best they would do was drive by a few times. Yeah, thanks. Real comforting. Last night, I was again up late. The dogs were barking like crazy yet again. At a little after midnight, I heard a noise. I mirrored the TV. I realized someone was pounding. Not knocking, but full-on pounding on the outer house door. Not my apartment door, thank goodness. I was freaked out. I wanted to go in and wake up the hubs, but I thought better of it. There was a window beside the outer house door where he was knocking, and that window was our bedroom window. And because hubs was sleeping and the lights were on in the living room, but off in the bedroom, I thought if someone opened the door, the person standing on the porch hammering the door would see the light and then know someone was here. I was afraid to let whoever was out there know that I was in there. I sat here for over 10 minutes of banging. It wasn't stopping. I thought maybe it was the police because of the call I made the night before, so I called the police and told them what was happening. I also told them about what happened the night before and about my call to them that night. I asked if it could be the police at my door. He looked into it and said that as far as he could tell, whoever it was was not from the police. He also told me not to open the door no matter what. He said he was sending an officer out, and if someone was still banging on my door, they would talk to them. He said he would call when he knew what was going on. The banging stopped about five minutes after hanging up with the police dispatcher, but I never got a phone call. I don't know if the police even ever showed up. Tonight, the dogs are already barking, and it's been for an entire hour. My hubs decided that I'm going to bed early and he's staying up. I doubt I'll sleep anyways. I made him promise that no matter what he hears, he won't unlock and open our front door. If there are any more shenanigans tonight, I'll update here in the post. A quick question. Is it smart to not advertise the fact that we're here? Not having lights on in the bedroom and not going to the bedroom window to get a look at this person? Or should we make clear that people are in fact in the house? Who knows, it could have been two different people here on two consecutive nights at around the same time. I just hope I never meet this person. Update. Like he told me yesterday, Hubs stayed up later last night. So when I go to bed alone, I put the TV on. It helps me fall asleep. As I said yesterday, our bedroom window looks out onto the porch and is beside the outer door of the house. Well, the neighborhood dogs were barking like mad again, but nothing happened. I'm thinking they realized that someone was home and possibly awake. Normally, Hubs comes in to check on me, and if I'm asleep, he turns off the TV. But he left it on until really late, so maybe they won't come back. Uh, thank you guys for all the suggestions. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here, as always, thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. I got a big update for you guys today, uh, it seems like the Teespring store is finally online, so if everything's going well, you should probably be able to see all of the new merchandise on the merchandise shelf below the video. I got some mugs. I got some phone cases, and I got some uh, t-shirts for y'all with the designs on them. All of the shirt designs are under one thing, so if you click on the sweatshirts, it should take you to a page where you can order a different variety of different kinds of shirts, so I just wanted to let you guys know about that. Uh, let me know what you guys think, if it looks good, the pricing, everything, so uh, look forward to that. As always, if you guys like the video, please be sure to like share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have a story that you'd like me to read, or you have a story that you'd like to send in yourself, please be sure to check the description of the video below, as it contains all of the links to my social media, including my Facebook, Twitter, Gmail, and Twitch accounts. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is, 
how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in, and what type of story it is, if it does have a type. Also, if you decide to send in a story, please be sure to properly format it into separate paragraphs. Uh, thank you guys very much for that. If you guys are curious about the music used at all in this video, it's all listed in the description below, in the order of which it appears in, with links to all of the artists as well. So if you enjoy their work, please be sure to check it out and support them. Speaking of artists, as always, my friend Alan is doing the thumbnails for the videos now, so I have links to all of his art pages in the description as well. So if you like his art and you appreciate it a lot, please be sure to check out his pages and go support him, because he does some really great stuff. I think that's all for today, guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.